Uh, today we're going to devote our entire episode to one person. His name is Neil Young. We're in a very special place in the Los Angeles area. It's called Topanga Canyon. It's a pretty remote place. There's one road in, there's one road out. It's kind of an artist enclave. It always has been. There, it, it, it's been a magnet for musicians, uh, actors, writers. They like to come to Topanga because it's not that far from Hollywood and LA, but it's you know, obviously out of the hustle and bustle too. So now if you've watched my channel at all, you probably know that uh, one of my favorite things to do, what really turns me on is checking out classic records that were recorded in unconventional spaces. And in early 1970, Neil Young tricked out his basement in his house here, built a small studio, and he proceeded to start recording after the gold rush, which is one of my favorite Neil Young albums. So uh, without further ado, let's check it out. right here uh, things are pretty narrow and very steep so uh, there's nowhere to park so we're walking up here uh, but it's a really beautiful place to be Neil Young had come out here uh, to Los Angeles from Canada uh, he lived in Ontario as a matter of fact he lived in Ontario my sister lives in the town that he's from Omimi a uh, very very small little town and I often wonder if he wrote uh, the song helpless about it so he came out from Canada and he settled in Laurel Canyon uh, he hooked up with uh, guitarist and singer-songwriter Stephen Stills. They created Buffalo Springfield, and after three totally successful albums, Neil decided it was time to go solo. So he came up here to Topanga. Just prior to uh, him working on After the Gold Rush, he released his second solo album, uh, which was called Everybody Knows This Is Nowhere. And it was a pretty influential album in its own right. It contained songs like uh, Cinnamon Girl, uh, Down By The River, Cowgirl In The Sand. What was interesting about it, he he used a drop D tuning in it. And what drop D tuning is, you take the, e, the low string on the guitar and drop it down a full step to D, and it gives things a big, uh, burly sound. To this day, a lot of grunge uh, music is written in drop D, a lot of metal is, but Neil and Crazy Horse decided to use drop D for his songs, and it was pretty revolutionary sound in 1970, 1969. So the other thing that happened was that uh, about a month before he released uh, Everybody Knows This Is Nowhere, uh, Crosby, Stills, and Nash formed. They put out a record, their debut record. It was absolutely tearing up the charts. And that band quickly realized that uh, they could not perform uh, live this music without a lead guitarist and another vocalist. For Stephen Stills, Neil Young was the obvious choice for this. But David Crosby and Graham Nash, uh, they wanted Neil to be a, a billed as a guest star. Stephen Stills argued for him, and, and, and Neil said the only way he'd do it is if he got equal billing. And uh, I don't think you can argue with the results of it. And, you know, Neil always said at the time, he loved playing with Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. He loved that he didn't have all the responsibility for all the singing, for all the songwriting. But as Neil himself said, if you follow every dream, you might get lost. And as the months wore on, he uh, grew more and more focused on his solo career. You know, uh, although Neil Young was one of the most prolific songwriters ever, in uh, 1969, he was uh, suffering from uh, some writer's block. So a good friend of Neil's that lived here in the canyon was Dean Stockwell. And uh, Dean Stockwell was a, he had been a child actor. He actually uh, starred in The Boy with the Green Hair, which is a great anti-war movie way back when, when I was a kid. But uh, Dean was also a writer, and he was writing a screenplay called After the Gold Rush. And uh, he was writing it for Dennis Hopper, who had just done Easy Rider. And it was about, it was a futuristic concept about a... Uh, earthquake and a tsunami that uh, overtakes Topanga right here. Very futuristic. He asked Neil if he'd uh, be interested in writing some music for it. And Neil said yeah, and that kind of spurred his, uh, his creative juices, which uh, brings us here. The house. All right, so we're going in. Here it is. All right, so this is the studio. Uh, it's really a lot smaller than uh, I thought it would be. It's probably, God, maybe 12 feet by 12 feet. Very, it's it's uh, very cozy, but uh, you know, you put five, six guys in here uh, playing with all their gear and stuff, and it could get kind of 
product. You can see the uh, the walls are reinforced, and obviously the control room used to be in the kitchen in there. Of course. So uh, uh, this is where it happened, and right here would be the uh, isolation booth where they would, uh, I don't know if they'd sing in here or if they would uh, uh, put, there's a lot of things in here, so they would put the cords, their, their amps in here. There's a lot of stuff for the amps. And uh, uh, the, uh, you could see the little waves in the ceiling right there to, to uh, muffle the sound. But uh, the interesting thing about this room and what they did right here was there was no room for a reverb unit. In those days, they were bigger too. They didn't have digital like we do now. So if you listen to this album, uh, after the Gold Rush, everything on the record is very dry. It was recorded with just the room echo, ambient room echo in here, and there's almost none. So, and if you listen to it, it's a very, it's part of the record that's really obvious too. Makes it what it, what it is. The band that he had up here was Neil on guitar, of course. Uh, Danny Witten wasn't with him so much. He was having his uh, personal problems. On bass, they had uh, Greg Reeves from Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, and on drums was Ralph Molina. Their secret weapon was a guy named uh, Niels Lofgren, who now plays with Bruce Springsteen. You all know him. Uh, Neil met him when he was 17 years old in D.C. at a concert. Lofgren gave him a tape, and, and Neil thought it was really good. So uh, Niels made his way out here, and Neil asked him to play on the record, but he didn't want to play guitar, he wanted to play piano, and Nils didn't know how to play piano. He played accordion as a kid. That was a secret weapon. If you listen to it, his parts are just great, too. You know, Neil has said before that what he was doing here uh, with Crazy Horse wasn't necessarily creating hits. He was really trying to make things interesting, something that people would listen to again and again and find new stuff and would stand the test of time. And what I think he was really describing was classic rock before it was invented. So. The way Neil would work is he'd be upstairs in the, uh, in the living room, he'd come up with a song, he'd come down here, the guys would be here and they'd go at it. He described it as audio verite, uh, which is, uh, we all know what cinema verite is, it's where you record everything, warts and all. And again, if you listen to the record, you'll hear stuff on it, people partying upstairs, you can hear dogs barking on it. Uh, there's a lot of warts on it, but uh, that's what makes it really the texture on it and everything really great so all right so uh i think we're going to take a little trip downstairs and uh, check that out so three puppies <laughs> carved right through the stone okay so a very special thing here this is the tree house and uh This is where Neil used to come up and uh, write sometimes for inspiration. And you can clearly see that there is a lot of inspiration to be had here. Um, uh, this is really cool, man. You can, you can, you totally get the vibe up here. Hi. <laughs> oh, this is just absolutely awesome. piano has been apparently passed down between uh, uh, she doesn't know a whole lot about it the, the new owner of the, uh, of the property but uh, I can tell by the way it sounds what it was You know, there were a couple really standout tracks on this record. Only Love Will Break Your Heart comes to mind, which supposedly was written about uh, Graham Nash and Joni Mitchell's breakup. For me, my favorite song on the record is Southern Man. I love the lyrics to it. I love what happened post-Southern Man on it, too. You know, Leonard Skinner's song, Sweet Home Alabama, great song, too. Sweet Home Alabama has the line, I hope Neil Young will remember Southern Man doesn't need him around anyhow. It was a dig at him, but as it turns out, Leonard Skinner, they really like Neil Young. As a matter of fact, Ronnie Van Zant used to go on stage with a Neil Young uh, t-shirt on. I've heard rumor that he was buried in that shirt. Neil Young took it all in stride. Uh, he kind of was tickled that they, uh, that they used that line, and they later became pretty good friends. Neil wrote a couple songs for him that never came out. You know, I think it's also worth mentioning that as he was recording after the gold rush in the midst of it, uh, you know, Neil found time to write Ohio for Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, which is my very favorite song they ever did. He was reading a Life magazine, you know, about the Kent State shootings and just kind of all poured out of him. Before its release, Neil had voiced some uh, concern over After the Gold Rush because the recordings had gone so easily 
you know, there wasn't any drama involved, and it wasn't something he was used to at all. Since then, Neil has released over 50 albums, and he stated that uh, the turning point in his career was uh, after the gold rush. Uh, if you uh, like classic rock and, uh, and uh, classic legendary records, you should check out the channel. There's a few of these kind of things on there. And I'd also like to shamelessly ask you for your subscription right now, if you haven't already done it. But uh, again, I want to say thank you for Tim, for Neil, for Crazy Horse. Peace out.